first get excited about an idea, it's super easy to lose focus of what it is you're actually trying to do. And basically what I'm getting at is that that phase where uh, you, you have an initial idea, but then you start to get a ton of like little ideas that, that build up the bigger idea. Or if you're more on like the code and development side, you start to get the, the, the starting code to work and you start to make things like, like bloop and beep and store in a database and all that. To that time is really exciting and, and it can be potentially distracting. And it's distracting from the ultimate goal of what it is you're trying to do, which is build something useful for other people. And generally speaking, unless you're you're trying to build something that's either going to be free or like if it's a, a tool for developers, something that's open source, generally speaking, you're you're looking to get paid for that idea, either in like a smaller sense, like this thing is going to be like a high side hustle for you, or maybe in a bigger sense, like you want this to take over for like your full time job, like this is how you make your living. And in order to do that the thing that you're building or the underlying idea or premise of what you're building has to resonate with a certain market or a certain market segment. And this word market gets kind of tossed around a lot. Like if you've ever listened to, to startup folks giving interviews or like, uh, like those TV shows where they have entrepreneurs kind of like go and pitch to a bunch of investors. Uh, you'll always hear this word market come up and it's always like this aggrandized thing. It's like, well, this is like a, $50 billion market, or this is like a $2 trillion market, or something crazy like that. And if you're not familiar with the term, it can sound kind of confusing. But ultimately, all a market is, is it's just a group of people who have a problem, who also have cash on hand that they're willing to exchange for a solution to that problem. That's it. That's all a market is. It's just a group of people. Now, the reason those numbers are so big is, generally speaking, you're... you're and it depends on the, the type of product that you're building ultimately. But generally speaking, like the bigger the market, the better. That means there's going to be people who are willing to buy. Because realistically, when you're building a product, like, well, not everybody necessarily in that market is going to buy what you're selling. You know, like you've got uh, iPhones and Androids are in the same exact market, but different types of people prefer iPhone, different types of people prefer Android. We're going to kind of get into to why that is. But, but ultimately, the point here is that a market is just a group of people who want to give you money. But in order for them to give you money or want to give you money in the first place, your idea has to really resonate with them. And, you know, when it comes to offering a product, the, the way that you do that or the way that you get to that point is by coming up with a, a value proposition. Like, when you build a product, you're proposing to somebody like, here's why you'd want to buy this or here's why you'd want to give me your money. And in order to create a successful product, you have to be very clear about that. It's not something where you can just kind of like, oh, well, it's for these people and this group. And it's like cat toys, but for dogs. And it's, it's you know, but it's, it's not just for dogs. It's also for hamsters. And it's, 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 that typical thing that you get into, um, and this is regardless of how much experience you have. I've, I've done this hundreds of times where you, you get too excited about the idea and you forget that like, well, I have to sell this to somebody like somebody specific has to, to want to buy this. And so when it comes to getting that clarification and figuring out like, well, what is my actual value proposition? Like what is the, the unique selling proposition is the other term you'll hear for this. Um, what is that? Like, how do I define that? A good place to start or a place that I like to start is with the people. So literally the like, who am I building this for? So generally speaking, when you, when you start to work on a product idea or you just have an idea in general, you came up with that idea because it resonated with either something that you've experienced as a problem or someone you know has experienced as a problem. But there's, there's definitely like a who involved. So it's very rare that you're going to think of an idea for a product and be like, oh, it's for everybody. Usually you get to everybody by not being specific in the first place. It just kind of like spirals off. But generally speaking, like you're, you're, there's going to be somebody in mind. And usually it's yourself. But I found that figuring out the who. So like who is the specific person that this product is intended for? And asking questions like what is their life like? What is their day-to-day -day like? 
what do they care about most? Knowing those things is going to better help you define a value proposition that's going to, to resonate with that person or rather the, the market that that person occupies. And there's a few different reasons for this. So once you know the who, basically what that's doing is it's helping you to ensure that what you build ultimately solves a problem that that person actually has. Because, you know, if you say, oh, well, I'm, I'm selling adult diapers to 16 year olds. It's like, wait a minute, this is a little ridiculous. And so you, you kind of have to consider like, well, yeah, if I know who I'm building it for, the problem that I'm ultimately solving, or if you want to think in terms of software, typically you're solving multiple problems. The problems that I'm solving are going to be something that those people actually have. Because when you get that that kind of mismatch between the problem you're solving and the people, it's like, well, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're not going to get what you want. Another thing that it does is it, it, it helps you to adjust your messaging to better resonate with that person. Uh, ultimately, what this means is when you write your, your marketing copy or you talk to people in person about whatever product it is, it's a lot easier if you know that the product you're building is for them. So uh, if, because I, I know a lot of uh, developers listen to this. So if I go to a PHP conference and try and sell them a JavaScript framework, it's kind of counterproductive, right? Like it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if I know that I'm building a JavaScript framework and I say, well, this is for JavaScript developers, it makes it a lot easier for me to write my messaging because I'm not going to have to contort things and like be really like cryptic with my wording just to try and fit this broader market or this group of people that the product's not actually intended for. And then the third one, and this is kind of by extension of all that, is that when you know who it's for, you can also better price the product. So it's not so much that your unique value proposition or your value proposition is because it does this, but it's maybe because it costs this much. So maybe people in a wider category, a wider group have the same problem, but certain segments of that market are, are going to be willing to pay X amount versus others that might be paying more or less. It doesn't really matter. But the point being that if you know who they are, you can better price your product according to or relative to their own financial position. And so ultimately when you when you know who is buying your product, it's making defining your value proposition that much easier. Because if you think about it, it's like, well, it's far easier to both build and sell the product if you know that the customer is like a young mother with three kids who's trying to balance her work schedule with her kids' activities. Right? Like that's hyper specific. That's not something that I can really get confused by. Whereas if you just say it's like scheduling software, it's like, well, that doesn't resonate with any specific person. You know, like everybody has scheduling problems, you know, unless you're a monk. Actually, monks have scheduling problems too. So it's like basically like if you if you're if you can't be specific with it, then you're not really gonna be able to to sell it to anybody and it's gonna be that much less compelling to people who might be in the market for what you sell. Because if I know that, oh, well, I have uh, a unique perspective. So say, uh, I happen to be a mother. Don't get confused. <laughs> uh, I happen to be a mother with three kids and I'm trying to really figure out my schedule. It's like, well, it's super easy for me to build that product. And we, we talked about this in the, the last episode about, uh, defining a vision for your product. And this is kind of related. It's basically like by knowing who your product is ultimately for, it's going to be a lot easier to target that person or that group of people. And so uh, an example I thought of earlier about this is Etsy. So if you're not familiar, Etsy is a website where you can buy like handmade items from a broad marketplace of people. So basically, if I happen to knit scarves, I can sign up to Etsy and sell my scarves to other people. Um, and Etsy isn't that dissimilar in terms of its functionality or like the problem that it's solving from something like Facebook Marketplace or an eBay or I guess you could say Amazon too, right? It's not that different in terms of the functionality. It's a marketplace where people can sell things to you and you can buy them and then they'll send them to you. But the reason that Etsy doesn't really get swallowed up by all of those bigger competitors or just put out of business is because of their value proposition. And if you go to their website, it's, it's literally the headline on the site. It, the headline is, if it's handcrafted, vintage, 
custom, or unique, it's on Etsy. Hyper-specific. There's no confusion about what is for sale on Etsy. They're not saying, well, we have handcrafted items, and we have mass-produced items, and we have all this, and we have all that. No. It's very specific. They're saying, it's if it's handcrafted, if it's vintage, if it's custom or unique, it's on Etsy. Nothing else. And I know a lot of... Uh, especially first-time entrepreneurs or business folks who are, are just trying to like get their feet wet with this stuff, that can sound kind of alarming. It's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's I'm, I'm blocking out all these people, but nobody's going to want to buy my product if it's that specific. And it's just not true. That actually improves your chances because that person exists in theory, right? Like that person is somewhere out there in the market. And if you can tap into who they are and say like, well, do you like handcrafted vintage customer unique items? You're going to get a yes or no. Like the, like you're going to it's going to very easily filter out the type of people who are going to want what it is that you're selling versus the people that are not. Whereas if you're saying you like stuff, you like to buy stuff. Well, yeah, everybody likes to buy stuff. So, you see the difference like it's it's not going to be as easy. So, I I don't want you to get scared, especially if you're just starting out and thinking that like being super specific or focus on a specific niche is going to limit you. It's really not. It's going to help you more than it's going to hurt you. And ultimately, what this does is it gives you a unique position in the customer's mind. It's one of those things where you you have to consider that the and you know this because you're you're living in the world. I hope you're living in the world. You're not just kind of ambling about through life. Um you know that the world is noisy. There's a lot of stuff competing for your attention. So the more specific you can get down to the person level, that's the stuff that's going to jump out at somebody. So if, uh, say you're building something where you end up doing some advertising and you're, you're advertising your product. So we'll, we'll go back to Etsy. So if I'm looking for stuff online to buy, maybe I want to decorate a room in my house or something like that. If I see an ad as somebody who's interested in handcrafted vintage customer unique items, it's like, well, there you go. That immediately attracts me and it makes it that much easier for me as the, the product owner to pull those people in. It's not something that, you know, they're really going to have to think about. It's like, oh, well, yeah, that's who I am. That, that makes sense. So once you figure out the who, another thing to consider is the, the actual problem that you're solving or the, the pain points that someone's going to have alleviated by buying your product or getting your product in their life. So uh, a good example of a pain point, and this has been a never ending pain point. We're talking years here and I still haven't found like a really, really good solution. I did find one, but it kind of changed because of the rules. Uh, but one of the problems that I've personally had is scheduling content like this podcast on social media. So I, I, I love producing content. I have a lot of fun doing it. But it's incredibly difficult to promote it because you've got all these different social networks and each social network kind of has its own rules for the type of content I can post and the length of the content that I can post. Some of them have rules about you can't post the same thing within some amount of time or ever. Um, each social network has its own system. So like Twitter, has you, you have to input content this way. Facebook has this way. All the others have another way. And then the ultimate problem too is like, well, if I'm using that platform directly, it's like, well, I have to do it in real time. I can't schedule it up, which makes it difficult because like I like right now I'm recording this podcast before it comes out, like the day before it comes out. And so I want to get that work done the night before and schedule it off. So this is this like massive problem that I have. And if you think about it, like there's, there's a lot of different pain points in there. There's a lot of potential products or, uh, a bigger product that can solve all of those problems. And ultimately there are products that do that. So uh, the ones that I've used are like Buffer, Hootsuite, and Meet Edgar. And they've all focused explicitly on solving those pain points. So keep in mind, this is a specific problem of managing social media accounts. That fits into the broader problem of marketing a business, but all of those products I just said, so again, it's Buffer, Hootsuite, and Meet Edgar, all three of those are designed to focus solely on scheduling social media content or organizing your social media content, not organizing, promoting your social media content. 
And what's even more interesting is that within that group, all three of those also focus on different types of customers. Like I know um, Hootsuite is for like big organizations. They're like like Fortune 500 type of customer. It's like you've got a, like an actual social media team. Whereas something like Buffer is, it's more for teams, but it's like small business. It's like, you know, maybe like, I don't know, five, maybe 20 people at most, but like a, a smaller team that's going to use it. And then something like Meet Edgar fits like the, like someone like me, like the the solo entrepreneur, like people listening to this, like indie product makers who, you know, like you want the, the power of a tool like that, but maybe you're not running this like high-end business that can afford like tons and tons of money per month. But the, the, the point here is that each of those products is targeting specific pain points. So they help me to schedule the content. They help me to define a content library. Like in the example of, oh, well, I'm not allowed to post duplicate content to all these social networks. I know that uh, the, the Meet Edgar service, they give you this neat feature where basically they'll, they'll automatically crawl the content that you give them. Like if you give them a URL for a blog post, they'll crawl that content and then they'll automatically generate like tweets and Facebook posts for you or they'll do their best to do it. And it's really cool. And it's like, that's solving my pain point. And that's super specific. And so the reason I call that out is not only is it solving a specific pain point, but notice that it's creative. So being able to generate posts for me isn't something that I would have thought of. I just want to be able to schedule content, but because they are focused on that specific pain point or set of pain points, those sort of features organically come out of that. They're able to figure out like, oh, okay, so the problem is, well, they're going to have duplicate content or they'd like to have duplicate content or promote the same thing multiple times. Let's make it easy to do that. And so when it comes to your own product and your your unique value proposition, you, you want to kind of figure out like, well, what are those pain points? And this doesn't have to be complex or overly original. Like, Ultimately, the pain points I just described are posting social media content or posting content to social media. That's it. You know, it doesn't need to be this like grand thing like, oh, well, I'm solving uh, the time space continuum or something like that. It's like, no, just keep it simple, but be specific. You got to know like, okay, what are the pain points that you're actually solving? And there's one caveat here because I do come across this. So when I explain this idea to mentees at Clever Beagle or if I'm just talking to other developers, um, or just other entrepreneurs who are building products. I see this, and I've done this myself, is making sure that you're not identifying something as a pain point just to justify your idea. So what I mean by that is saying like, oh, well, yeah, of course people have that problem because I built this feature. So it's kind of like the, the feature precedes the pain point, not the other way around like it should be. It's like, well, that pain point should actually exist before I build the thing. So just keep that in mind uh, kind of as you're going with this sort of stuff and as you're defining your value proposition, not to, to fluff yourself because it's super easy to, to be delusional with this stuff and end up still creating something that people don't really want. Um, and kind of ultimately here, because I, I don't want to, to stretch this out too long. I want you to... to understand that this doesn't need to be complicated. But there's there's one more thing I want to talk about, which is when you're coming up with your value proposition, you want to think about, and, and it's in that name, so like unique selling proposition or unique value proposition, you literally want to think about like, well, what makes you unique, right? Because realistically, somebody else is already working on your product idea or some version of it. It's It's not like it's this wholly unique thing. Maybe it is. And if it is, you're probably not going to be listening to this podcast. And that's fine. That's not to, to shame you. The product that I'm working on technically already exists. I'm just doing it in a unique way or what I think is a unique way and will resonate with people. And so if you can figure out what makes you unique, and I, and I don't just mean like, oh, well, we have this feature. This makes us unique. You got to remember that like features can be copied. Like a competitor can come in tomorrow, look at your feature set and say, like, yep, we're going to copy that. That's not unique enough. You know, it's it's more so on the terms of like, if you think about yourself when you're going to buy something, it's it's not so much the what you're buying, but it's like, why that company? Why, what is it about the way that they're selling it to you that makes sense or resonates with you? And that's what you're trying to bake into your value proposition for your customers. You're trying to say, here's why it's unique. And it doesn't have to be like an overt or obvious thing necessarily. Um, so a good example would be, uh, I, I keep 
you know, thank goodness I, I still have my hair. Um, <laughs> I hope it doesn't go away. Um, but if it did, um, there's this company Keeps. I keep seeing commercials for them, and I see, like, advertisements all over the web and stuff. And I, I, I was really fascinated by Keeps because, and it's, it's K-E-E-P-S, um, and I'm, I'm sure if, you've, if you watch TV or anything like that, unless you're like a solely Netflix person, you've probably seen an advertisement for this. But basically, it's, it's a product that's existed for you know, a long time, at least a few decades, which is uh, hair restoration for men. You know, like, so, you know, you, you get a little older, your hair starts to fall out, you start to have a life crisis, and you're like shaking a little bit, like, oh, God, my hair is falling out, what am I going to do? And it's this just like really jarring experience. But like that problem has in so many ways been solved. And what I notice Keeps is doing is they're not necessarily trying to sell some like newfangled like gel or something that you rub on your head or something like that that grows your hair back. But instead what they're doing is they're they're taking the the pain and the potential embarrassment out of having to solve this problem. So the way that they've done this, and I looked into it because I was really curious about it. The way that it's organized is they've streamlined the process for getting the, the medicine that you need to, to kind of kickstart that process of growing your hair back. And what they've done is they've made it super easy to get in touch with a physician. So they have pre-approved physicians that they can, they can send you to and that know about keeps in their program and how all that stuff works. And they can pick out the right medicine. I, I want to say, this may not be correct, but I think they've got like two different types or a few different types of uh, the, the, the medicine that they use to, to help with this. Um, they have two different types and they, they can send you to a specific doctor and the whole process is streamlined. So once you've met with your doctor, like you, you get on a subscription plan and they send the medicine to you directly in the mail. Like it shows up in a box in the mail. It's not something where it's like you have to go to a doctor's office and be ashamed of yourself or something like that. Or like, you know, like just get into these awkward situations. And in addition to all that, the other thing that they did that was really cool is the branding is super solid. Like the, the, the logo is sharp and the packaging is real nice and it, it feels cool. And again, thankfully I'm not in this position, but if I were, I would bet that there's two emotions that don't come up when I think about, oh, my hair's falling out, which are uh, being cool and having hope. And conveniently enough, the way that Keeps has packaged everything and marketed it to people, it gives them hope. It makes them feel cool. And if you go and look at a lot of the other uh, competitors for this, they don't do the same stuff. The process is a little convoluted. There's some like hoops that you have to jump through. It's not as easy as like pulling up a website or pulling up an app and like filling out some quick information. And so the point I'm making with all this is that that's super unique. That's something that's very difficult for uh, not just for competitors to recreate, but it's it's very difficult to end up being muddled in with everything else. It's not just a hair restoration product. It's like, oh, wow, that really stands out as like this unique thing. And as a customer, and a certain type of customer, but as a customer, it's like, wow, that that looks different to me. It doesn't look patronizing. It doesn't look like everybody else. And so just by the virtue of doing that, they've kind of indirectly baked their their uniqueness into the value proposition. That is the value proposition. It's like, wow, this stands out. This feels put together. This feels clear. This feels organized. It doesn't make me feel bad about myself. And so those sorts, and I, I don't want to say that <laughs> this is a sensitive topic, but I don't want to say that the other hair restoration businesses are doing this. But generally speaking, like when you look at this Keeps company, you're like, yeah, like this, this, this feels right. Um, so... Ultimately, and, and to kind of to wrap up here, what you want to realize is that your, your value proposition ideally is going to change over time. That doesn't mean your idea is going to change or your core focus or like the, the people that you're building it for is going to change, but the value proposition might change because maybe you start off with like a really stripped down version of your product. Maybe like uh, the UI isn't that good. Like you use like a, a, a just a generic UI framework to, to build it. It works. It looks decent enough, but it doesn't look unique. Like we just talked about, it doesn't stand out. It doesn't have its thing. But the reality is that like over time, you might evolve that. You might redesign the product or you might change things. And understanding that you can can evolve this stuff as you go is super important because it's 
it's it's it's basically a fundamental reality of doing this stuff is that you're it's rare that you're going to get it right 100 percent on the first swing and if you look at a lot of the products that are are big and popular today most of them didn't get it right on the first swing they had to change it they had to tweak their their value proposition like well maybe like this keeps company maybe they they had like a really solid product like the 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 quality of the medicine they were selling is great but like the packaging wasn't great i, I don't know if that's true but i'm just kind of just for example making this up but maybe like the the product was really good but the packaging wasn't that great or the system wasn't as streamlined as it is or something like that and over time they were able to build to a point where it was as good as you see today and so you want to keep in mind like it's not just about getting specific in terms of like the the who is buying your product or the uh, the unique qualities of the product or the the pain points, but it's also just realizing like those things are going to change over time. The people who are interested in your product are going to change over time. So if you're you're kind of stressed out about this or you're worried about it, don't you know like just relax and realize that like okay, I have plenty of room to experiment with this, but I need to be willing to experiment with this. You need to be willing to say okay, I'm going to over time keep evolving this product and keep evolving it to match whatever the current version of my customer base is or my audience is or my market is for my product. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, and, and, and ultimately this, this happens all the time. We see this constantly. So you get like, um, I'm trying to, I want to say this sounds right. Like Dunkin Donuts or somebody like that. Like they, they've been around for a long time. But you'll notice, like, over the last few years, like, they, they just suddenly reemerge. Like, they've become very popular, and, like, a lot of people go to Dunkin' Donuts that I, I don't remember seeing in the past. And that's because if you go and look, it's like, well, they, they streamline their value proposition. They've made it, like, oh, America runs on Dunkin'. It's, it's very, like, oh, this is for the, the average working person or the common person. Like, that's the value proposition. It's, like, it's affordable delicious like food and coffee like it's it's something that fits that market segment and so it's it's very specific but the point is dunkin donuts didn't necessarily have that value proposition back before they they had to evolve toward that so ultimately the the point i'm trying to make is you can evolve you can develop this over time so don't worry about getting it 100 percent your first time just try and get it as you go so I think that's going to do it for this episode. Hopefully that's that's making some sense to you and, and helping you to better figure out how you think about your value proposition or if, if it's not something that's been on your mind, at least getting you to start thinking about it. Because again, it's super easy to, to get caught up in the, the technicals or the actual creation of the product and forget that you're, you're building your product for people. So again, the, the more specific you can get about who's buying it, uh, the pain points that you're actually solving, and then thinking about what actually makes your product unique, the much easier of time you're going to have developing that value proposition and attracting the right type of customers to your product. So I think that's going to do it for today, folks. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week.